This podcast is sponsored by the animation studio, Tonic DNA. You're listening to the Story Driven Arts Podcast, where the visual arts and storytelling come together. I'm animation director and your host, Todd Schaefer. My guest in this episode is Tom Bancroft, who was the supervising animator for Mushu on Disney's animated feature, Milan. He was also an animator on Pocahontas, Tarzan, he did Young Simba on Lion King, and Iago on Aladdin. You might know that Tom has a twin brother named Tony, who has also worked on many Disney films as a character animator. Together, Tom and Tony produce a podcast that's well known in the animation industry called the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast, which has over 150 episodes. If you enjoy the month-long Instagram event in May called Mermaid, Tom was the one who started that. He continues to animate as a freelance animator and teaches in the animation program at Lipscomb University in Nashville. This is episode five. Well, Tom Bancroft, thank you so much for being on the podcast um, today. Yeah. You are, you and your brother are interesting figures. You have both worked on Beauty and the Beast, Lion King, Aladdin, Milan, Brother Bear, and Big Idea. I don't think a lot of people know that you were on Big Idea, Veggie Tales, Joe and the 321 yep. Penguins. Um, you have created, um, You've written a book called Creating Characters and Personality. You have a second book called Character Mentor. Mm -hmm. You've illustrated over 50 children's books. You've been a character designer for who knows how many projects in in, in L.A. and all these studios. Uh, You worked on Superbook, CBN. You have a a website, teaching website called Taught by a Pro. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're uh, you're teaching animation at Lipscomb University. that's phenomenal the amount of work you're doing um tell me a little bit about yourself yeah (laughs) it's funny because whatever people kind of list out all the things i've done and and you you didn't hit everything of course uh it it makes me tired i I I do get tired um i i feel like i've and by the way so the funny thing is yes i have a twin brother and we both started in the animation industry at the same time about 1988 um we were going to cal arts And we were only there for about a year and a half. And then we we left to go into a Disney internship that started May of 1989. And that was while they were making The Little Mermaid. And so uh, we didn't get to touch The Little Mermaid, unfortunately. uh, But we got to see it being made, you know, all around us as we did tests and stuff, you know, as part of the internship. But we're trained by that team, you know. They would pick an animator to mentor you. Like everybody each intern kind of got paired up with an animator and we also got paired up with a cleanup person so we could kind of learn both things. Uh, So that was really neat. And then we had sort of like a a week or two, it was only nine weeks long. We had a week or two where we do something special uh, aside of that. Like some people would do some layout, some people would do storyboarding. And uh, if I remember, I did, I did layout. Um, And I almost got, I almost went in that direction, believe it or not. I, um, I, I found out later they did, they did hire me after that internship. I'm on a tangent now. Sorry. It's okay. But I, it's semi-interesting. It's um, semi-interesting. Both me and Tony, the, the internship was to start the new Florida studio. So like everybody in that internship was being trained. And the idea was, was that as many of them as possible, there's about 20 people in our internship and they were trying to get staff the new Florida studio that was going to be part of Disney MGM Studios. It's going to be a working studio, but it was also going to be a tour where you can watch us work. And they were going to have a few pros in there too that they would bring from California. But largely, they needed like three fourths of the staff to be like super green, right out of school, eager, you know, um, you know, and not have mustaches so we'd look good at Disney World. Um, and so that was where we were planning on going. Um, I found out later we did get into the, we did get hired to go to Florida, um, at, into cleanup and I became our Kansas assistant, which was a blessing. Um, but I found out later that I'd actually gotten, uh, a job offer from California studio to go into layout based on my layout drawing that I had done one or two drawings. I can't remember, but they were like, Oh yeah, we'll hire them into that. If you guys don't take them, but Florida had first uh, rights to us, I guess in the internship. So they didn't even tell me that I had a job opportunity in California, even though I grew up in California, I probably would have taken it 
and become a layout artist. I don't know, but that would have been a whole different yeah. direction. Yeah. Um, and I think my brother had a interest from story. Maybe I can't remember. Maybe both of us, one of us was think they were thinking about for story and one for, for layout, but we ended up becoming animators. We went to Florida yeah. and did go into cleanup right away, but then, uh, uh, you know, got into animation, uh, pretty much right away within the first two years. Wow. And that, that so, first show was what that you worked on? The very first thing we did, and, and the funny thing about the Florida studio is that they, Disney didn't know what to do with it. Um, while they were building the park and planning the park, the, the story is, the legend is, is that the Imagineers were going, okay, and this is where we're going to have like an old like Hyperion Studios building. And why they didn't do the Hyperion Studios, I don't know, because it was supposed to look like the whole park was themed to look like the 30s, right? Hollywood in the 30s. Mm. And so a Hyperion Studios, the original Disney Studios, where they made the Mickey Mouse shorts way back when, that would have been perfect. And they were going to do like a, they were going to recreate it there. And then they were going to have animatronics in there acting like they were drawing. This is, uh, and it would just be like a tour you'd walk through and you'd see animatronics of people yeah. flipping fur and acting like they're making Mickey Mouse shorts. And so um, when they pitched that to Michael early on in the development, he said, what? wait, what? No, I thought this was going to be a real studio. Why, why do we have animatronics in here? Why wouldn't we just put people in there and make, <laughs> isn't that cheaper? And all that. And so uh, literally in one meeting, they turned everything. And, and that's why that, that studio from day one was a, a rush and they were constantly changing their minds. Okay. Oh, okay. Now it's a real studio. Now they had to redesign the whole thing. Now they had to get desks for it. They had to, and so they literally only had a couple years tops of, of uh, you know, from designing it completely to having it staffed, uh, which may sound like a lot, but in the world of Disney, that was nothing. And so they had to retool the whole idea to make it a working studio that was still on tour that had glass and uh, because now they had to split it. Like Imagineering could kind of just plan the space. Yes. For the tour and the actual, you know, what you call the user experience, I guess the guest experience, but the studio side, they didn't know how to plan that. So now they had to bring in all new people. That's when we got Max Howard. They somehow tapped Max Howard. He was the head of the, um, a lot of people don't know this, but our, the Florida studio actually has roots to the UK to um why can't i remember his name now roger rabbit um oh, yeah. the uh richard williams uh, richard williams thank you yeah. to the richard williams studio so max howard was the head of the operations of the richard williams studio and so disney hired him and said hey you just wrapped up that roger rabbit movie can you come over here and real quickly basically help us staff and design in a brand our second animation studio we've ever designed and, and staffed since the original one 80 years ago. So he came in and he did all that. He hired a couple people and helped with hiring. And that's when my internship kind of popped up out of nowhere while we were in CalArts our second year. And um, that's how that all happened. But they, long story short, they were, they were changing their mind. What would be our first project all the way up till we were sitting in the desks, you know, May, the opening of the park, um, May of 1989. And it was going to be Roger. It was going to be Mickey Mouse shorts. We were just going to do those until they could come up with some other idea, but it was just going to be one after another Mickey Mouse shorts. And this was, by the way, they were completing Prince and the Popper. So we were going to go on to whatever was going to be after Prince and the Popper, um, which was a Mickey featurette. And, uh, but they really quickly um, s switched that because Who Framed Roger Rabbit had come out the year or the summer before and was hugely popular. And so we ended up making two Roger Rabbit shorts out of the Florida studio. So our very first project was Roller Coaster Rabbit, which was oh. a Roger Rabbit short that went out with, believe it or not, Dick Tracy, the movie that nobody remembers with Warren <laughs> Beatty. Uh, and so that one came out. And then we immediately, uh, the other thing that happened was they had split the Florida, the California studio into two groups. This was right around that time where they said, oh, wait, we want to double our production because why are we making like, one new animated feature film every say four years let's put one out every two years and and split our staff and so when they and that was right when lion king and pocahontas was that split right yeah and so 
to get ready for that, Rescuers Down Under also simultaneously was behind. I know this is way more than everybody wants to know, but uh, so they were That's like, we need help. Stuff. We need help on Rescuers Down Under. So as soon as we finished Roller Coaster Rabbit, which was about our first year there, so this was around 1990, 91, they said, oh, we need you guys to work on uh, Rescuers Down Under. And we had Mark Henn. And Mark Henn is, was like one of the top five Disney mm-hmm. animators, and now he yeah. was in Florida. And so what they did was they said, well, you guys got Mark Henn. He's as fast as five animators. We Great. We're going to send you huge sequences. And so they did, and I was his assistant. So I had a ton of work right off the bat, wow. uh, right after getting done with uh, Roller Coaster Rabbit, because uh, they ended up giving him chunks of Cody and Nick Leach, the bad guy and the little kid, and and then Bernard and Bianca sequences, because he was super adaptable, and then he could also like, like I said, churned out so much footage. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, three to five. Uh, he was worth three to five animators uh, yeah. what he put out. So he kind of like kept half the cleanup department busy. I couldn't wow. do all his work. I had to had other people working on scenes too. And so it was a uh, trial by fire. So we did restaurants dinner, but then from that point on, we did such a good job. They were amazed that this brand new studio, cause we tried, you know, you know how that is being in Canada yeah. and, sometimes when you're number two, you try harder. (laughs) And that's definitely what we were. We were young and eager. And, Mm -hmm. and so we were putting out some really good footage right off the bat. And so from that, that led us into basically becoming a feature film. We started just doing pieces of uh, the California features Mm. for many years. So we went right from rescuers down under right on to what was after that Aladdin, and then right on to Lank, uh, Beating the Beast. Sorry, I think I went out of order. Beating yeah, the, Beating the Beast. Years, Beating the Beast, Aladdin, right on to Lion King. And we just kept getting bigger and bigger sequences. As And then our staff kept growing, too, to go along with that. Um, the big one that was the um, – and I know you have questions, so I'll get there in a second. <laughs> um, okay. the, the big testing ground was we were getting better and better, and we were also getting bigger and bigger chunks but they gave us our own sequence on Lion mm. King to kind of try us out, see like, okay, the corporate people were like, can they do their own feature pretty soon? And to, the test on that was the can't wait to be King sequence and Lion King was all done in Florida from art direction all the way to end animation, cleanup backgrounds, everything. That little sequence that looks like a little mini short film because yeah. it's a totally different style. All of a sudden yeah. that was all done in Florida. Wow. So you, your most of your career was in Florida then for Disney. Did you work in LA yeah. at all? Um, my internship nine weeks, um, which I wouldn't say that's working in LA. And then yeah. at times I would go back. Um, I worked at Pocahontas, so I would go back for a couple of weeks to work with Glenn to yeah. get trained on on how to draw her and all that. Mm. But no, I, um, my whole Disney career was in Florida. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, about 12 years. And that wrapped up, when did that wrap up? Because that, that came, came to a close. For me or for yeah. them? <laughs> um, I left a little bit before them, so before they okay. shut down. Um, and I actually left twice. So um, after Mulan, uh, and again, Mulan was our very first feature that we did completely in Florida from beginning to end, story all the way to the end. Mm. And then, so we did three features. I didn't know that. Yeah, a lot of people don't know this. So we'd we'd helped on the features, and then we really geared up for Milan. We went from, like, say, 100, 150 people to, like, 300 uh, Mm -hmm. for Milan because that was going to be our first feature. And so, and then kind of grew a little bit past that Mm -hmm. because we did um, Mulan, we did uh, Lilo and Stitch and Brother Bear. Those were the three that we created from beginning to end, Mm. by the way, all very good films. Kind of proud of that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But we had gotten to be a really strong studio. We didn't have a lot of turnover like they did in California and stuff where people were coming and going. We all were moving there, you know, having babies, buying houses and just, you know what I mean? Laying, laying, uh, playing seed. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and that made us a tight family. We really were, um, I've never ever seen or, uh, been to a studio like that. There are no others out there, probably in Canada, um, <laughs> where it felt like a family. We were all yeah. had been there for so long. A lot of us had gr- kind of grown up in animation at that mm-hmm. studio. And by the time we did Mulan, we were about 10 years old and many of us had been there from day one at least the core core group, especially. Um, and so 
that made us this strong bond. We knew who, what, who was good at what we knew, you know what I mean? And we would try and, you know, promote from within and, and nurture the people below. And it was really, uh, in a way it was the 2d Pixar, I think, um, where, um, but, but on the artistic side, even stronger than like Pixar is known for story That's and great. nurturing that side. I, I wouldn't say we were that as much as we were the artistic side. We had amazing painters and animators mm. and cleanup artists that were just top notch. Mm. So you left before Lilo and Stitch. Yeah. So yes, I, I was about to be a supervising animator on Lilo and Stitch. Um, I had finished Mulan. And there's a long story to this. I'm trying, I'm already being long. <laughs> um, I ended up getting sick after Mulan. Um, I took on too much and then I, I kept taking on more. I didn't really take but a week off of after Mulan after doing about a year's worth of overtime. And then they Cause you said, were oh, supervising Mulan. Uh, Mushu. I was supervising Mushu. Yes. Yeah. So I was yeah. a supervising animator. I was really trying to prove myself. And of course, as you know, how that goes, we all yeah. kill ourselves in those roles and trying to prove mm-hmm. ourselves. And then, but I finally made it to where I wanted to be. And that's kind of the heart of that story, which is I, 10 years of just working and trying to move up the ladder. I finally made it to being one of the top people at the studio, at least in the supervising role. And this number two character on the film, which was amazing more than I deserved at the time. And then, um, and then they said after, right after that, they're like, Oh, well, can you work on Tarzan? I was the only one in Florida that animated on Tarzan. we had this mm-hmm. one little sequence and we just did so great on Mushu. Can you do this funny little sequence with these elephants that argue about piranhas? And I was like, Oh, sure. I took that on. But meanwhile, I was already during the day doing John Henry, which was Mark Hen's directing debut, which was a little short film uh, that he was directing. And so I was a supervisor on that. And so I, it ended up, I came off of Overtime Mulan and started, I went right back into Overtime. I did a Roger Rabbit 2 test. Um, I did uh, John Henry during the day and at night and weekends, I was doing Tarzan. And I just burned out and to the point where I, I got viral meningitis is what happened. Wow. I, got a, I got a sore throat that went into my brain, the infection did. And oh my gosh. wound up in the hospital. And so long story short, I'm also a Christian. I'm a believer. So yeah. I don't see accidents. I see God's yeah. hand. And yeah. so when I saw, I went to the hospital and I did survive it. But after a week of being in the hospital, I came out and he put a different vision in my eyes. Like I still loved animation. I still love Disney and I couldn't wait to get back. But all of a sudden it wasn't everything. Um, mm-hmm. And that's the best way to describe it. And I couldn't, that wouldn't have happened without that experience. I had to learn, oh, wait, I haven't been concentrating on my God. I haven't been concentrating on my family. Mm-hmm. Um, I've only been thinking about, you know, and I would, I would go home and we kind of all know how this is too in the animation industry. You go home thinking about the animation you did all day. You, you're yeah. replaying it. You're going, how could I make it better? Uh, you know, and, and your wives, <laughs> wives or husbands are going, okay, I'm here. It's dinner time. <laughs> Let's put that away. And, and now yeah. it's phones and stuff. But back then it was just imagination. I would just be mm-hmm. thinking all the time about how can I do better? And anyway, uh, that kind of, that part just died down a little. And I think in a healthy way and it opened up my eyes that, Oh wait, there's more out there. And I, and then simultaneously. And again, I think this is a God thing. I get this strange email within a month of that, mm-hmm where it's like a job opportunity that a friend sent to me. And it wasn't really even to me. It was like to a big group. I was in the national cartoonist society. So it was like a blanket email to all of those people. And, Oh, here's an animation studio. I can't take this job, but if you're interested. And it was at this little dinky studio called big idea productions. And they were the makers of veggie tales, which Mm -hmm. is a really low end computer animated (laughs) um, uh, vegetables that Mm -hmm. talk about God and do little skits and funny things. They Mm -hmm. really are good, but, Mm -hmm. but from the animation standpoint, especially looking at from on high where I was at Disney, Mm -hmm. it was like, why would I even be interested in that? And um, as a job and, but I, and that job, by the way, it was like a technical job. It was like a computer technical person they were looking for. And I was like, so I didn't even apply to that, but I just, 
immediately got obsessed with this little company. I was like, yeah, I've heard of VeggieTales. My girls watch it at church and, and yeah, they're funny. I like, yeah. And I start going on the web. The web was pretty new. I'm like, oh, they have a mm-hmm. website, whatever that is. <laughs> Big idea. Yeah. com. Okay, I'll try that. And I start reading about the background of Phil Vischer and Mike Naraki that created it. And they're just these two guys out of college. And here they are again, eight, about eight years later at that point. And it's this thing and they're trying to be like the, the Christian Disney or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And they're building it and it's in Chicago. And I'm like, I don't want to go to Chicago. But anyway, long story short, I find myself basically reaching out to Phil, him getting excited. And within about six months, I'm I'm packing the bags. We're selling our house. Oh my god. Turning down a job on Lilo and Stitch as a supervising animator to follow my heart. Cause I'm just like, I think I'm supposed to be there at this hmm. tiny little cold studio in Chicago <laughs> and making less money and with no real job title. Hmm. Um, and that's what happened. I did that for about two and a half years. And unfortunately yeah. they went bankrupt. Uh, yeah. I, I, the joke is I say is that it started about the day I started. So it paid <laughs> me too much. It was still a step down pay wise, but it was way yeah. more than they had, I think. Um, so so anyway, you were there for how many years? That, about two and a half. And yeah. then um, I immediately called as soon as I got laid off uh, because, of the, again, they were laying off almost everybody down to a skeleton crew. Yeah. Um, they, uh, I called Disney and said, hey, you know, what's going on? I knew Brother Bear. I kept up with all my friends there. And so mm-hmm. I knew Brother Bear was kind of in trouble. And so I said, do you guys need help? And they were like, yeah, if you can get here in two weeks. I'm like, I can be there in a one. <laughs> So wow. I literally went over there. I think I was there for six to eight months and just helped on the very end with Rut and Took, the two Moose characters mm. on Brother Bear, and then stayed for another year, started my own company out of my house. And while I slowly watched from my friends that were still at Disney, uh, Disney Florida starting to implode, unfortunately. And yeah. uh, by the time I'd already decided... I think I'd moved already to Florida. I mean, to Tennessee where I live now to, to start my company, uh, funny pages productions. Um, uh, that's when they shut down the studio was that Christmas, um, mm. just over that Christmas holiday and laid off like three, 350 people. It was really yeah. sad. What a dark time. I, I had gotten out of there before then as well. Out of where Florida? Out of no Los Angeles when they're oh, shutting okay. down. Yeah. 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 So you're talking about Disney and Florida was shut down in 2000. Oh yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, that okay. was all Florida. When yeah, I went yeah, back, okay. I'm sorry. It wasn't clear, but when I went back, I went back to Florida, Disney, not yeah. California. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it wasn't too long after, but that. no, it wasn't. That was within the, and that was why they were shutting it down. They were transitioning over to CG. Yeah. It, it hit California just after that, that they started yeah. doing massive layoffs too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember those days. Yeah, it was very sad. That was sad. So, so what did you do at your company? What kind of things were you working on? Were you, was that where, when you started doing your books and uh, children's yeah, book illustration? Um, and- yeah, right. One of the first things I did when I left Disney was um, it was nice because I'd just done Brother Bear and the, the – I wanted to get into animation because that's all I knew. Mm. I always loved illustration, but I didn't think about it. And so the producer of Brother Bear, he kind of set me up really when I wanted to leave and start my and go freelance. I wasn't really thinking of it as a company yet, but at least go freelance. Mm. And uh, he said, well, why don't I get in, tra- in, in with uh, Disney Publishing in California? They're really behind on Brother Bear. They got a really late start. I don't know why, but I think because all the changes to the film – and so they're they're in trouble. And you already know how to draw most of the characters and stuff. And I had all the model sheets that they probably didn't have because they never share. And so yeah. I was like, yeah, I'll just I'll copy model sheets and stuff. Sure. Mm-hmm. And so I did. I worked on the Brother Bear storybook and stuff like that and did some Disney publishing. Probably the first year was a lot of like Disney publishing kind of work off and on and other mm-hmm. illustrations. Stuff. And then VeggieTales also, they started going – Oh, well, we're starting back up again. We got bought by Classic Media that and then later DreamWorks bought them. And, right. But they're like, we've made a deal with Scholastic and we could use you to illustrate some of those books. So I did I did like, I don't know, eight or ten VeggieTales mm-hmm. children's books too. Um and so that that first couple of years I, I really became more of a children's book illustrator. Total I've I've illustrated, believe it or not, about fifty children's books. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, 
That's another whole thing. So you left that out, but now I'm no, no, I didn't say again. you did. No, I put the, I put it in there. You, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <you> listen, <laughs> but the funny thing is, when you first started, you said he's done all this, and the, or the Tony and Tom have done all these. Yeah. It's funny because you threw in a couple of things like VeggieTales. Tony yeah. didn't do that. That was me. You know, I know we, it was you. You we were the, on the get, Disney features. I just didn't clarify yeah, when you when right. your his stopped. <laughs> yeah, and he didn't work on Brother Bear either. So oh, okay. There were a couple yeah. wrong, but yeah. they, he did. Uh, it's funny that always happens. Like I, yeah. and that's the other thing is like, if you think I'm busy, it's because some of it's true, but then another is you're probably lumping in a couple of things. Tony did <laughs> and probably. people always do that. They cross pollinate <laughs> our, our backgrounds. Well, I had no idea you, you were the East coast and he was the West coast guy. Yeah. Yeah. Largely uh, our animation, our Disney animation career has been, well, and actually everything since then, really, he's mm -hmm. still in California. Yeah. I'm in, I'm in Nashville now. Yeah. Right. And so you united with your podcast. Yeah, we really did. I mean, it's funny because when we were both at Disney, Tony, Tony came to Florida that very first year with me and we both got that job and then, but he was, he'd gotten engaged over that Christmas and so there became an opportunity to, to move up and stuff and to do an animation test. And so I was already married and we really liked Florida. And so I didn't put my animation into that California mm -hmm. chance, that possibility Tony did, because again, he was engaged. So he was like, Oh, I'd be willing to move back, especially if I can get promoted and marry this girl. So he did that. And so that separated us. So after the first year, okay. Um, his whole career was in California and mine was in Florida. Um, mm -hmm. And then mine later on was Nashville. I've been in Nashville maybe 16 years now. Wow. And you worked on Superbook. Yeah, that was during, that was, uh, um, we started that. I had a business partner, one of my buddies from, uh, from Florida, uh, one of the animator buddies from Florida. We, we expanded a funny pages productions together in Tennessee. And especially once, they shut down that studio. He came and joined me. And then um, one of our big clients was a uh, big idea first. We did a lot of storyboarding mm -hmm. and character design for their second feature film and some of the videos. And then also um, uh, a little bit of Disney publishing and, and other VeggieTale pu publishing. Uh, but then uh, Superbook for CBN, mm -hmm. they came and they said, we have this old anime, 2D anime thing that we did back in the early seventies. Um, it's really hard to watch. If you watch it yeah. now, it looks yeah. like speed racer, like the old speed racers, very limited yeah. animation, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I've seen parts of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, but kind of interesting designs. I mean, like fun, you know, like speed, speed racer type stuff as a lot of the same people actually worked on it. Um, uh, and so anyway, they were like, we want to reinvent it and kind of bring it back. And so we actually directed the pilot episode and, and did all the development, brought in people from Disney and other places and kind of created a virtual studio to, to create that pilot. And then they ended up doing five seasons or so. Yeah. I mean, like they, they mm -hmm. did a pretty good amount. And I, I ended up leaving and doing abcmouse.com and helping to develop that educational mm -hmm. thing for about two years as co-art director with my buddy Rob and then left that and funny pages to the, go back to CBN. And I ended up being the head character designer for about four of the four of the five seasons um, wow. on uh, Superbook. And they're still working on that, aren't they? I believe. Yeah, I think they still are. Yeah, I think they're kind of wrapping it up, if I remember right. Last mm -hmm. I heard. Um, but yeah, they they're still still doing. I think I'm there on their fifth or sixth season, and I think it might be the last one. Mm -hmm. So when did your art instruction uh, online start? When did, when did you yeah. Okay. So that's my fourth career. <laughs> yeah, I, I do kind of uh, consolidate them like yeah. my Disney days and then my funny pages productions days. And they, and now I'm kind of in the third one, third or fourth box, which would be um, my teaching. And so that really started as soon as I left Disney. Again, I was starting to get there before when I got into publishing. Um, ironically, no, again, I don't believe in accidents. Uh, a friend of a friend from a comic con, he was a comic book inker. He knew somebody over at Scholastic and uh, actually, actually Watson Guptal. They got uh, bought by um, Random House. Watson Guptal had done like the How to Draw the Marvel Way, a lot of these major art books through the 80s and stuff 
anyway, they approached that buddy of mine and said, Hey, I don't know anybody in animation. Do you know anybody in animation? We want to do an animation book. And that this is an editor at, at uh, Watson Guptill. And he goes, Oh, I've, I only know one Tom Bancroft. I met him at a comic con. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so through that guy, uh, they, they got in t- contact with me. And again, I had just left uh, Disney. So this was back in, you know, two, 2003 ish, I guess. And so they said, well, can you pitch us an animation book? Uh, And I thought immediately, I mean, imagine this happens to you, right? You're like, immediately you go, okay, well, Richard Williams, I think his book was either about to come out or had just come out around that time. Mm. And that's like the Bible of how to animate, right? The Richard Mm -hmm. Williams one. Oh no, that one had already come out or just, okay, let's say just about the Eric Goldberg one was about to come out. It was being, I heard about it and stuff like that. And so that's the crash course one, but we already had the illusion of life too. And before Mm -hmm. that, right. So there's three major books on animation and I'm like, well, you don't, why do we need to have another animation book? We got those three and they're amazing. Well, or we'll have three. And so I didn't think I can compete with that. And so I just immediately said, I looked at my bookshelf and I said, well, what's missing? What, what don't I have? Right. And I looked and I saw that there were no character design books hmm. and I'd gone to Cal arts. I had a whole semester's worth of, of character design. So I knew there was hmm. a lot to discuss on the topic. And, um, and, and I looked at all the art books that I had, the illusion of life and, and both of those other books by um, Richard Williams and Eric Goldberg. And, it's only the first chapter of all those books. They talk about character design and right. then they move on. Right. And I was like, we need a character design book. And so I pitched mm-hmm. Watson Guptill that idea. And of course, one thing I found out, and this is for your listeners, um, the people that pr- publish books don't actually know or read the books that they are publishing. <laughs> and so this editor had huh. no idea when I said character design, they're like, what is that? And then they were like, how does that work? And what that doesn't sound, that sounded like a small niche to her. And so what I did was mm-hmm. I sold her and I said, you know, I had to do like a 10 page outline uh, uh, oh, with wow. artwork in it just to prove that this is what I was going to try and do all, all the table of contents and sample chapters. I had to put a pretty good amount of work just to get this idea across that. No, 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 this is not just a niche. It's character design is a part of video games. It's a part of live action feature right. films, you know, Marvel films, especially nowadays, Mm -hmm. and then TV and film, um, children's book. I mean, everything that has a character, you have to design it first. Once they saw that, they went, oh, dollar signs. Okay, yes, let's do that. Let's do character Mm -hmm. design. So that's where creating characters with personality came from. But I had to really really sell it. Yeah. And your online classes, when did that start? Was that just an extension of your books? I mean, once I that was the thing is I never saw myself as a teacher at that point in my life. And so me going down that road of writing that book and illustrating it, uh, the first book was like a really big awakening. I was like, Oh, okay. I had to really analyze. How do I think about when, you know, most artists, we're not good at that. We just draw. And when when somebody says, how did you do that? It's so hard to explain. Well, I just, no, no, no. How did you know to do that? I'm like, well, I don't know. And so I had to really kind of one, go back to my notes from Cal arts and, and other notes from Disney and places where right. other character designers are talking about process and stuff. And I started really, and I still am got to be a geek about process, about how do we think as artists? And if, and that was the beginning of that road was that first mm. book. And, and I really try and make every book and every article and even every video, which was taught by a pro later on, my, my website, um, more about how to think as an artist. And I don't, I'm not big on step by step. Yeah. And that was the other thing I discovered was like, I don't really, because that only applies to that one little thing. Like, Oh, I'm going to show mm-hmm. you step like the Lee Ames books. He's a very talented person, yeah. but his books growing up, I was like, Oh, this is how you draw an owl. You start with a circle and then you do a triangle body and he would do it as basic shapes. And then here's like 10 steps later, you have this rendered owl <laughs> that's perfectly yeah. cleaned up because you've erased all the back lines. And, and, and it's just like, well, I would just draw the owl at the end. I wouldn't do all the steps. So just copy that. But now, even if I did all the steps, that's all I can draw now is that owl from that angle with no expression, but that expression I can't make it angry. I can't make it happy. 
I can't turn it to the side. Right. And that's what you get out of that, that yeah. step-by-step process. Mm-hmm. Is you don't really learn how to think about yeah. that character and the dimensionality of that character. Mm-hmm. It's good for very early learning because you're learning that shapes are, everything is a basic shape, that concept. Yeah. That's still important, mm-hmm. but it's only important until, you know, maybe beginning of high school. Yeah. It's a training wheels. Once you get it is, it's it is, right. a place to go. Right. Yeah. And many people are still using those books as like, no, 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 this is foundational. And it is foundational, but they're like, they don't go beyond it. Yeah. And that's why we have so many people on Instagram and elsewhere where they're, they know how to copy really well and shade right. and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. guess what? Here's, here's the surprise to everybody. There's no job in that. <laughs> Nobody's hired <laughs> for that job. Well, it's the same thing in, in life drawing. You see this, a lot of the life drawing is uh, very copyist and not constructive. They don't understand the anatomy in terms of construction and being able to shift stuff around. So they're yeah. married, married to whatever reference they get right. in their paintings and drawings and things. So, so how, did, um, how did Taught by a Pro come about? You were... So this was a few years later. Um, I, again, a, a church friend of mine, he had been teaching online um, instruction, but, it, uh, but more on the IT side, like creating the, the background, the, the, uh, the website and then the mm-hmm. learning environments uh, for, for colleges. And it was all tech stuff. It was not art. Um, right. And I got, and I had been doing some online stuff just for fun. Uh, I'd start to get kind of a following on um, DeviantArt originally, and then later Instagram. And so I, and I think I had a Patreon page pretty early on. I think that's when I started doing it, where I'd say, okay, I'm going to do this online thing. I'd throw out a date and say, just join me. And, and I would draw and give some art instruction. Um, Mm -hmm. And I can't remember, I think I charged for it even back then, um, but very little, like 10 bucks or whatever. And I get people, it was pretty early on in that. Like I know people mm-hmm. are doing that all the time now, but this was pretty early yeah. on. And I was like, well, this is kind of cool. And I, I like, I like this art instruction thing too. It was, it was feeding off of the books. I was, I had to think I'd put out my second book already too by then. And so when I met him, my buddy, I was just like, the lights went on. I'm like, well, wait a second, we should talk about what if we created this video based website where we put up videos. And I was really looking at it as like a YouTube for art instruction where Mm -hmm. eventually, and we never really got there, uh, but it'd be curated where we, we would not, everybody could just throw up videos, but if you went through us and we approved it, we could put up more and more videos from other users Um, and as it was, we put up many, it wasn't just my art instruction. Mm. Mine were probably the most of them, but my brother did a few videos. We had John Pomeroy did some videos, Ruben Aquino. We got basically, that's why I called it taught by a pro. I wanted it to Mm. be professionals vetted. It's not YouTube. It's not these tutorials that are just out there and you don't know who these people are. If you can, I guess in a way, trust their instruction. Right. This was, this was experienced high end pros telling people how to do art instruction. Mm-hmm. The only other person doing that at the time was schoolism, Bobby Chu. Yeah. Um, he had started uh, around that time uh, doing that too, or maybe just before me. So, um, and, but his was, I don't know if his was video based as much as ours was. We just said, we want to just put it up and the, the, the sale to the instructors were like, you're going to make money as you sleep. And, and literally as we were developing that Skillshare was popping up too. So right. That was the big one that ended up, they, they were well-funded and they went into all kinds of different, we were going to really kind of uh, mostly be about drawing, animation and character design. Um, and we were going to expand past that, but uh, we didn't quite get there. We just recently disbanded it. It's still up, but we're, we're uh, in the midst oh. of expanding the website. Yeah. Cause I've kind of moved on to other things, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. Do you, did you get a lot of students going through that? Yeah. Yeah. And and it wasn't really built to be like a school. I I always wanted to sell it as this isn't a school like schoolism. Maybe you put together a package and you have kind of a school. Mm. I wanted it to be like little, you know, they're hour long videos, but more like you're attending in a class. Okay. Right. You know, here's a class by this person, a class by this person. And you could do it on your own, kind of put them together and go, okay, I've kind of have 
created my own semester's worth of school, mm. but I, I never wanted to sell it as a school. And, and maybe that was a fault. I'm not sure. Um, but in my mind, I wanted it to be a curated professional experience of videos that, mm. you know, um, and I'm still proud of it. And we did well, we, we definitely were making a little bit of money and, you know, it was, uh, but we really weren't, and this is my own fault. Um, I was just too active in those five other things yeah, <laughs> you know, know. that I'm always know. doing to really, you have to invest in it. You have to put a lot of time into it. And I should have, I, I probably had, I don't know, 11 videos. I should have had 90, you know what I mean? Yeah. I should have, and those are just mine. We should have had hundreds and hundreds of videos after a few years. Yeah. And that would have been a larger investment. Of course, that would have been a lot of money to put into it, but to really make it work. That's, that's what it needed. Yeah. It really needed. And you'd have to drop everything else that you were doing. In order yeah. To do that. And that ultimately, I just, I, I wish I would have, I wish I wanted to, but I didn't want to drop everything yeah. else. Yeah. yeah. No, I can understand that. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of work. I mean, you're, you're redirecting your entire career <laughs> into that area. And um, well, I still felt like I, and I still do like, I still have my best work in me mm -hmm. and i i hope i keep feeling that way um <laughs> but uh you know it's hard to kind of go solely into business which is that kind of was was even though it is art instruction it was it felt like okay but i'm not going to produce any new ip i'm not going to be creating mm -hmm. a tv series i'm not going to create a feature film that is still on my bucket list and so mm -hmm. if i'm not going to do that then yeah so anyway i i just wanted to keep going with some of that before I just do the business side, I suppose. I don't know. I don't know if I ever want to just do the business side, I guess. Yeah. No, that's, that's hard. I mean, you're a creator, you're, 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 you're that yeah. mindset. You don't have the business mindset and that's a good thing. <laughs> I know. I, I, but I love business. It's so funny. The irony with me is that I love, I love, I love to listen to business podcasts and stuff. Oh, and goodness. even when they get into kind of the nitty gritty and a lot of it, I don't totally understand, but but I love startups. Like that's mm -hmm. super exciting to me. And I've started up many, I have a couple LLCs mm -hmm. at every given moment <laughs> because wow. I, I have partnerships with other people and little businesses here and there. And I've done quite a few over the last probably five to 10 years. Um, and, but again, I have to look, sort of <laughs> concentrate <Yeah>. on one <laughs> to really make it succeed. I think I'm getting there. I think I've finally figured what I want to be when I grow up. So so meanwhile, you decided to take a position at Lipscomb University. Yeah, then there's that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you got me. Um, yeah. So, well, again, okay. So this was a bucket list that I didn't even know. Um, the dean over there of the College of Entertainment and the Arts, uh, Mike Fernandez, he came to me because I he'd been he'd heard about me, um, just that there was a Disney animator in Nashville. And so through a friend of a friend and he approached me and said, you know, we'd love to put you. And at first it was to consult for their film program. They were going to start a film program right then. This was like about a year, year or two before we started the animation program. And he, he put me on the board of that committee because I'd worked on future films, even though they were animated. And so, and Steve Taylor was the head of that, that film program. I was a huge fan of Steve Taylor. He, he w used to be a Christian music guy. Oh, uh, Steve Taylor. Yeah. Okay. I know who he is. Yeah. It was kind of like punk rock almost in the eighties. Yeah. Uh, and, and he directed he a, blue light jazz. Yes. Yes. And so yeah. he'd gotten into film because of blue life jazz and another film. And, um, and so he kind of considered himself more of a filmmaker and he was, he uh, was getting his master's degree in film and, and was going to head up the film department and, and does he's my boss now. But the irony is, is that hopefully you'll like this story is that Tony and I, when we first were, we were in high school, we were at a little tiny little church in California. And they said uh, to the youth group for that we were in, they're like, Hey, we're going to do these music videos because Christian music videos were popular. Music videos were brand new <laughs> at the time. And, you know, Amy Grant and Steve Taylor and uh, Michael W. Smith were just breaking out. Those three were the big, the big ones, but there are a few others. Of course, it was just becoming this big thing at the time. And so they're like, make a music video. We're going to have a big youth retreat thing. And then we'll show them. And that was sort of our summer project for the, for the youth group. And, uh, 
And so Tony and I had just discovered that one of our best friends knew how to do clay animation and had a super mm-hmm. eight camera and we had never animated before. We were like, that's it. We're going to make a, a clay animated music video to Steve Taylor's song. Um, uh, lifeboat is what it was called and uh and it involved there's some live action pieces and then we'd cut away to the classroom it was like a teacher instructing her students and steve taylor does like this falsetto for the teacher and we just put tony in drag and 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 then filmed him as the teacher and then we'd cut to the students cut back and forth and we, whenever we cut to the students they'd be clay animated and so it was really a cool idea it was super ambitious it was a classroom full of like eight or nine students and camera moves and things like that and we had no idea what we were doing we were reading books literally this back in the day yeah we had to go to the library and find out how to animate how to find out about apertures on your camera and things like that that we had no idea and so the fa- it came out i mean it kind of somehow came together at the end and we didn't know about editing we had to literally splice it with the film yeah. and the strips and the gluing mm. and the, and so we literally filmed it at this youth retreat thing and and uh the, everybody went crazy um and and i don't know girls noticed i guess and that did it we were just like <laughs> oh girls like this i think we're cool <laughs> so yeah that's what got us in animation the yeah. irony is and again i don't believe in accidents Steve Taylor is now my boss at Lipscomb. So when Lipscomb came and they said, oh, and by the way, Steve's coming to this. And I hadn't met him before. He's going to be at the meeting too. I was like, okay, so where do I sign? How do we do this? Yeah. How much do I make? Oh, I don't care. You know? And so, well, and then on top of that, I mean, here's the dirty little secret of my life is Tony and I don't have a degree. We we have, don't even have a bachelor's degree. I always say I have an mm. HS. That's my high school degree. Oh, okay. And so we left CalArts a year and a half in and got into that Disney internship. And part of it was desperation. We didn't have any money to stay at CalArts. And so um, never got that degree. And then just learned on the job. from. Yeah. And that's, you know, our generation. I'm going to include you in my generation. I yeah. don't know if we're the same age, but. I think we are. Pretty close. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know there's a lot of people in the industry our age that never got a degree Uh, cal arts it was almost like a joke like if you got a degree it was because you you sucked you couldn't get a job that your second (laughs) year or your third year right that's so true pete doctor did get his degree he was one of my classmates uh, but he yeah he got his degree but it was because his parents wanted him to so there were always those two and i'm sure he never regretted not getting it i kind of sometimes regret not getting it but anyway so when when lipscomb came to me and said and I tell them up front, I'm like, well, that's nice, but I don't have a degree. There's no way you're going to let me lead this and start mm-hmm. up a whole animation program, a guy that has no degree. And they're like, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. And and I kind of felt like, so I was like half vested for, a, I was consulting for about six months. I was thinking, I'll help develop the curriculum. I'll look at Ringling and CalArts and all, how they do it. And I'll kind of, because I've written these books, I kind of have a lot of opinions. And the more I got into it, the more I figured, I realized, oh, I have a lot of opinions about this, mm-hmm. about yeah. how you teach students. And because I'd also been taught by a pro at that point. And so I was just like, I got into it. And then, but then I'm talking about like, I'm actually starting to teach some classes as an adjunct professor at first, because they're still trying to figure out how they can do this so they can pay me as a full-timer and, and, yeah. and lead this program. So anyway, they finally worked it out and said, after uh, about two years, they said, okay, now you're full-time and you're the head of the program. I'm like, well, that's great. Cause that's what I'm doing already. <laughs> Thank mm. you. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm not a tenure track. I, I don't really care about that anyway. Uh, and I hope I don't. 10 years from now, but I'm five years in and I'm the head of the program and they let me develop the whole program. And that wasn't going to come my way anywhere else. I don't think now, ironically, again, I keep saying ironically, and I don't believe it. (laughs) Uh, uh, Not, not maybe two years after I'd started doing that in California where Tony is, he gets approached by a small Christian university, just like mine, Azusa Pacific, oh, okay. and they say, we want to start an animation program, and we'd like you to do it. And Tony said the same thing. I don't have a degree. And they were like, we'll work it out. We'll work it out. And 
sure enough, now he's my main competition. <laughs> it's my twin well, brother in California. And so we've kind of divided up the map. Like I get students from here over Texas, uh, over to here. Yeah. I get, you can get Texas and then that way to California. <laughs> and so well, um, we try not to step on each other's toes, but we kind of let the students pick you yeah. know, where they want to live. Well, that's good that, I mean, you're, you're giving them an education that they're not going to get from most of the uh, animation programs in the other universities that are around. Cause I see them. Yeah. <laughs> There's only a handful of schools that I think have a, a decent animation program. All the rest, you know, it's almost criminal that they would take money from these students and tell them they're teaching. I agree. Animation. And that was kind of the burden I put on myself from day one was like, Oh my gosh all of a sudden I had this, this sense of when we first started the program, I'm like, wait a second, I have to answer to these. My clients now are the parents of all mm -hmm. these kids. Yep. You know, I, it wasn't like, Oh, now I can do whatever I want. I felt a heavy burden that I had clients now and many of them and that they could get angry at any second. Yeah. If their student, if their kids aren't one learning and two, hopefully don't you know, hopefully get a job within a, a reasonable amount of time of right. graduating. And so I still, to this day, that's, that's my number one sort of stress, I guess you could say, is that I want them to be trained. I want them to yeah. be ready. And, and so that starts from me looking at their portfolios before they even get here to yeah. going and, and hopefully getting the, I'm not quite at the point where I can throw out everybody. I wish I could, but I do, I am careful about, you know, being involved in selecting who gets to come to school, you know, cause we're kind of a boutique and that's kind of the way I'm looking at it is Lipscomb university. Now we have John Pomeroy teaching. Yeah. We have an amazing lineup. We have Tim Hodge, who was a story person at Disney, a good friend of mm. mine. We have like four Disney guys that teach at this tiny little Christian school in Nashville. Mm. And, and by the way, all four had worked at big idea too at different times. And so, uh, and then we have Mike Naraki and Steve Taylor, Mike Naraki, co-created veggie tells he now works right. at lipscomb and now oh i didn't know that yeah yeah it's it's quite a pedigree hmm. at this tiny little school in nashville hmm. so um we're very blessed and um and and we have more coming i have people from warner brothers that are moving to tennessee that are still working for warner brothers that now are going to teach next fall and they're females. Thank goodness. We had mm. all these old white people. Now we're going to have females and stuff. So <laughs> we need that in our, um, but you know, it was hard to find. I, it's important to me that we have uh, experienced people. Yeah. I don't want just, Oh, I got a master's degree in animation, but I never worked in the industry. These right. are all, every single person we have is, um, has some industry experience and most all of them, if not all of them are still working in the industry simultaneous. That's good. That's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I actually had uh, a, a, somebody in an animation program who was a teacher that he, mm -hmm. and he said the department was not trying to uh, uh, train the students to get a job so that they could get a job right out of school. They didn't want, they didn't want their students to go into studios and get jobs. They wow. were trying to make them more directors and visionaries and this and that. And I said, oh, okay, oh so gosh. you're, so you're uh, preparing them for the national film board. Oh no, 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 no. We're not doing that either. I'm like, I have no idea what you're doing. If you're not, this doing isn't that. Sheridan, I hope. No, it's not Sheridan. Okay, good. <laughs> Cause that's a good school or it, it has yeah. been for many so years. Sheridan, Sheridan is what one of the schools we, we uh, hire from. In fact, we just hired six yeah. students, uh, six that's graduates great. from, from Sheridan. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, that's a good school. It's It's yeah. been a good school when I was at CalArts. They were, you know, neck and neck. It, for yeah. Everything we always heard, it was like the CalArts of Canada, you know. Yeah. Well, is, Mike Surrey came out of it. Oh, yeah. Mike Surrey and Nick Rarineri. I had yeah, many friends right. from Disney yeah. that were uh, former Sheridan. That's how I heard about it. I didn't know about Sheridan until I got to Disney and met all these Canadians. <laughs> so, <laughs> I went to Sheridan. Yeah. <laughs> But I respect it. Yeah. So um, how do you approach animation instruction now? Do you, um, I, like, I, I, I've, I've talked to one, some students from one school that's probably one of the better schools I've seen uh, people come out with advanced skills. And they were telling me that they don't do the basic stuff that a lot of these other schools do, where they start with the bouncing ball and, and those little rudimentary things. They just jump them right into doing story things with characters and that sort of thing just to get their feet wet. That's interesting. 
Yeah. Uh, you mean storyboarding and not animation? No, no, just store character animation. They're right. Oh. They start off with character animation right off the bat. That's interesting. Um, we still do the bouncing ball and we do a walk cycle <laughs> right off the bat. Uh, yeah. I just don't see how you kind of miss that. Um, mm. Matter of fact, I taught um, 2D. So John Pomeroy, he teaches 2D animation one, our first animation mm. class in freshman. And then I, I have taught 2D animation two. Actually, I've taught all the classes first and now I, I've handed them off. Um, so I taught the storyboarding I taught. Um, so fortunately we have better people teaching some of the, some of the other classes like storyboarding and stuff that mm. uh, I've done, but it's not my career kind of forte. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, we still start with the basics because I find that so many students are coming into animation schools and have never animated. They don't they just know they like cartoons, and unfortunately, those yeah. don't make the best students. Unfortunately, I, right. I try and make it very clear when they're visiting the school. I try and scare them off as much mm -hmm. as I can. Like that's my job when I meet them is to be yeah. nice and you know schmooze the parents and stuff. And and I mean all that, and, and I sell the school. I'm constantly selling because that's what I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, but I'm also trying to scare them. There's an element yeah. there where if I sense. Now I can tell the ones I don't need to scare. They have a sketchbook and maybe two more in their backpack that they want to show me. And, and they're, they're workers. You know, you could tell those students right away mm -hmm. and their the quality level's pretty high, but even if it's not super high, you could tell this, this sketchbook's worn and they're, it's with them all the time and it's almost full or, you know what I mean? Or it's, they right. moved on to their seventh one for the summer and you're just like, oh, okay, well you've already got the disease. I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to even try to scare you on you're over. I mean, I always go to the parents. I'm sorry, but your son or daughter is going to be an artist. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's already too late. It's part of them. And I strongly believe that like yeah. we are born with this. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and it's, and, and, and I'm talking about creativity in general, uh, that could yeah. be a writer. It could be an actor, Mm -hmm. The drama kids, it's the same thing. They they are their own group of people. Right. And that's what I love about teaching at the college, actually. It's the thing I didn't expect to love was to see them all come together that freshman year, that first week, and they find their people for the first time. Because mm -hmm. these are all people that were freaks at their high school, right? That right. Had and they were least, loners. Yeah, they were a little bit of loners, and they were a little bit kind of freaks. And some of them better, more popular, better looking than others, you know, but a little more socially aware. Um, but in general, they had that one or two, maybe other friend that was also kind of an artist or kind of liked anime or kind of liked whatever. And they would kind of touch on those things, but now they're getting together with all, all of their friends now love all the stuff that they love. And now you add in competition on top of that. Some of them are even better than you. Right. And, um, and you get this just explosion of growth. And so yeah. to me, when people to come to me and say, do I still need to go to art school? Can't, there's all this online stuff. And here I am. I'm one of the people that started an yeah. online art yeah. instruction. I say, if you can afford it, yes. Because if you go to the right school, number one, that has great teachers, and Lipscomb's one of them, <laughs> you're going to learn a ton, more than you yeah. would. Uh, elsewhere because you're going to yeah. get one-on-one -on -one, and that mentorship is super big. Mm -hmm. But I said, the second thing that nobody talks about is that you're going to learn as much or more from your peers yeah. in a school setting that you never will get online. Mm -hmm. And that to me is worth all the money in the world. If mm -hmm. You can go to a sucky art school, but if you've got two or three artists there, students yeah. that are at your level or hopefully above, you're still going to learn a ton. Because yeah. you'll group together and you'll be each other's lifeboat getting through that horrible teacher <laughs> that can't teach and you'll make, you'll make it work. And, uh, and those students, I've seen them happen all the time and, uh, and they'll, they'll make it and they'll, those two or three will bound together and they'll get jobs. The rest yeah. of the students, well, they'll, yeah. because they got te taught bad and, um, and they didn't step up, but the, right. the peers that start competing with each other in a friendly way. And I can say this, I'm a twin with, the, with an <laughs> artist brother. Um, it's like supersized, you know, it, you just, you blossom. And yeah. so we try and really cultivate that in the school, the part of the culture. That's good. 
I mean, I, I've always struggled with what, what do you tell st students who want to be artists? How do you navigate the uh, art instruction programs all over the, the United States and Canada? How do you choose them? Um, because they don't have the, I mean, they, they, they're still at an entry level. They can't tell a good art school from a bad art school. Oh yeah. And, uh, I, I don't blame them. And their parents are no more help, right? Yeah. They know more about art and animation <laughs> than their parents do. Yeah. Um, because they're at least they're going online and following people on Instagram and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And so they have to inform their parents yet. They don't know anything about it either. They've never been to college yeah. before. They don't even know what that experience is about, much less finding. But I will say this. I mean, not like our generation. We had to go to libraries and find lists and things right. of, you know, right? And maybe yes. you would meet an animator once in your life as a high schooler or, they, or somebody related. Like, oh, this guy yeah. does a comic strip. But he knows he did animation once and he knows a buddy that doesn't, you know. Right. And you hear through that that maybe that guy went to this art school. And, and so you might hear about one or two art mm -hmm. schools in the country but now you can do a google search and put in yes. top animation right i mean like so lipscomb comes up when you put in i don't know and anim christian animation program i think we're mm -hmm. one of the first that probably pops up because that's how I, I ask everybody coming in like that's a big part of i love analytics and stuff and so i'm like how did you find out about us you know and most it's our half the time they were like well we just put in a you know or whatever and then nowadays some it's well i listen to the bankrupt brothers podcasts and you guys talk about it all the time or <laughs> or i follow you on instagram yeah. i have a lot of students that kind of knew me oh, know, cool. before they before totally they came cool. So, yeah, there's ways to get that information now, is mm -hmm. what I'm saying, that we yeah, didn't have. Um, so it's not that hard. And, yeah, and, you're and right. if you follow people on Instagram that you're huge fans of and you know they work mm -hmm. at Disney, you just DM them. What school did you go to? Every yeah. single one of them will answer that question. It's mm -hmm. not a hard one. It's not. It's easy. You start tabulating, oh, this, this many went to CalArts. This many went over here. This many. Now you have a list of four schools that are like the best ones probably. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah, you're right. And you had a you're few absolutely. outliers, you know, that went to these <laughs> odd schools. And, and again, they, they found their peer and they made it through. Yeah, that's it. So, so how do you balance teaching with your other stuff? Balance is the hardest thing in my life. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure it is in yours. It's the same with all yeah. of us. Uh, it really is. I mean, because you got family. It's the, mm. really, it's career and family. Those are the two boxes. And... Um, and if I can make those both work, and I'm just talking day to day, week to week, month to month, um, you know, that that's a great life, but it's so rare. And, yeah. and then you add in, okay, I want to do, I want to have a hobby or I want to have a sport thing that I do, or I want to have both oh, screen time. I want to watch this series, <laughs> whatever, or go to movies. Yeah. I mean, there's really very little else room. And so with me, I have a third box, very pretty big box, unfortunately, which is all my other dreams and hopes. <laughs> and those are the companies. That's the top buyer pros. That's the, that's the other stuff yeah. that I'm pursuing right now. It's feature films, it's TV series that I'm developing all on this sort of extra time that I really don't have. Yeah. And so some of that has to come out of one of these other boxes because mm -hmm. those other two boxes are huge, right? Yeah. The family box and then the making money, your career <laughs> box. Um, and so like we just did our taxes and uh, we're getting money back for the first time in probably I don't know, 20 years. I don't know. Wow. We were jumping up and down, but my wife, just very calmly looked at me and said, well, you know, it's because you made less money than you probably ever made. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Oh yeah, that's why that's this so money's, true. That's all this so money true. we just got, which is not that much, but it's a few thousand dollars. They're like, it's spent already because yeah. we got to pay off this other thing because yeah. you made so little. And it was because I was pursuing five other little dream projects that paid me $0 that yeah. may pay off a couple of years. Yeah, from now. I know that. Yeah. So, I'm somebody that's always got a project. And usually when I say project, it's really three to four to five projects yeah, I know. that I'm simultaneously, it's, I'm writing a book with my brother. Now, when I say that, I use it loosely because we're not working on it more times than, we're, than we are. But we do have a book project that we've, we got a table of contents. We got the whole thing. We, we've started writing chapters. And so, yeah, when I start something, I'm the kind of guy and I, I made this echelon change in my life 
right after Cal Arts, I started realizing I wasn't finishing things. And I, and I didn't want to be that guy. I wanted to go, no, no, no I'm going to do something and I'm going to finish it. And yeah. so now I'm at a point where if I get to a certain bubbling point on a project, I have to finish it. Mm -hmm. Not quite there on that book, but it's getting close. So I know we'll finish it because I will finish it if I have to without him. <laughs> and so, but because I'm doing it with him, I'm like, oh, we'll slow percolate that. Yeah. But I have these two other things. Like I do mermaid <laughs> every year. I created mermaid on Instagram about Oh, did five you years really? Ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> another feather in your cap. I, it's, it is, I don't know why I did it, but anyway, it was by accident. And so now every year I have in May, I almost lose a month of doing mermaid. And it's because now I'm, I'm kind of, I have to comment on things. I have mermaid.com and I have to make sure I run a contest and it's walk uh, sponsored by Wacom. And we're literally giving out like Wacom's as the prizes, like five of them. Wow. And, and so that's been going on for the last two years that we've been sponsored. It's a great relationship. They're wonderful. And, and they've really gotten behind mermaid. And this year I did a gallery events. It was going to be live on, until COVID, but it's at gallery nucleus in LA. And so of course I had to do an art of mermaid book, our first book that we've ever published. And so, <laughs> and then on top of that, I have to have a project for mermaid. I can't just, fill my Instagram yeah. with everybody else's art. I have to have my own project. So every year I make a project The last year, Tony and I did a little animated short. Um, and we did a, it was a mermaid and a seal. He did the seal. I did the mermaid and had a little story. It worked out great. It was only rough animation, but it was a, a minute long. And it, it, so we would show updates all through the month and then premiered it at the end of the month. And that was great. We'll probably do that maybe next year again, but this year I did a web comic. And so I had to write and illustrate that whole web comic. I released it three times a week and it was just like, I, I, this is why my wife complains. Like I made no money and I made a little bit of sponsorship money, but most of that was prizes. And so, but I was like, I got to do it. I'm, yeah. this is me. This is yeah. what I do in May. <laughs> so. I'm, I'm sensing a cautionary tale here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. If, if this podcast, everybody listening, if this podcast has changed from inspirational to depressing and <laughs> cautionary, uh, please listen to that uh, in your head because it's probably true. Oh, the other thing is we didn't mention it. Uh, the Bancroft brothers have a podcast. So please yes, listen right. to the Bancroft brothers animation podcast, uh, adjacent to this podcast, of course, because this is a wonderful podcast, but we have a podcast. So we have to do that. Uh, also. And we'll, we'll put link, a link in the show notes for, for your podcast. Oh, thank you. That'd yes, be lovely. Bancroft, Bancroft. You've been doing it for how long? Uh, that's been going on. I think now four years, we have 150 something episodes. Wow. Is it, is it weekly or bi-weekly? Bi-weekly. Mm, thankfully. Yeah. yeah. So we, and we have sponsors for that. So I'm, I'm tell, I tell my wife, like, I'm like the break even guy, babe. I, I don't get paid for my time, but we're breaking even on everything. Yeah. <laughs> and we need to celebrate that. <laughs> we're not in debt because of those things. At least uh, we're breaking yeah. even, you know? Yeah. And so I do have like, it's funny because I, I'm both like, I have a, I have a school job, but as we know, it's school, so it doesn't pay that great. I have to do other freelance, so I do freelance, working on Animaniacs at the moment, uh, doing animation retakes, mm -hmm. and hopefully we'll be working together on a project soon. Yeah, I think um, so. Uh, but I'm also... <laughs> So I have all these other, other little things that basically bring in little trickles of money, like yeah. my books. I get royalties from the books. It's trickle and it's trickled because they're about 10 years old. The, the first one. Um, and then the podcast, a little bit of sponsorship money and a little bit of this. Hold on. I got a dog scratching on the door. All right. No problem. That's how so, you stay sane. So, yeah, I mean, well, no, that's what makes me insane, but I think, but what I'm saying is I, I do think that that's where the world is going. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just old and I got there first and maybe I forced myself into this cause I can't decide on anything, but I do think that from here on out, and I tell my students this, that your life is not going to be, I, when I got into this, I thought I would be at Disney forever. 
And I would just like the people that I looked up to, the Mark Hens and stuff, yeah. I'd do 30, 40, 50 years at a company and retire. And that's yeah. what our parents' generation, our parents mm-hmm. did pretty much. And maybe they would have two careers. But nowadays, that is not true at all. Like you're going to have multiple careers at the same time, potentially. Yeah. I'm really living that right now where you have multiple uh, streams of money mm-hmm. coming in mm-hmm. and they're all little, unfortunately, probably, but maybe one percolates and gets bigger, you know, something takes off and that one starts becoming more of your job than these other ones. But mm-hmm. in general, you have to have, and I would think so the creative arts more than anything you have to have multiple money streams coming in. Right. And so that makes you very busy. Of course, it's, there's, there's ups and downs, but the YouTube generation kind of gets that, I think. Um, Cause if you watch the YouTubers and stuff, they're doing it in one area, like one bucket, which is sort of video. Yeah. And so, but some of them are doing a podcast and doing that. I mean, they're not all Ryan Seacrest. Like he's the craziest person out there. Ryan Seacrest just, he's doing this. And then, mm-hmm. you know, I also, when the ball drops at New Year's Eve, I'm there and then I'm doing this podcast and I'm doing this radio thing. And I'm the, he's got like five, 10 jobs. Well, you're not but, much different. I'm I'm trying to be Ryan Seacrest <laughs> of animation. That's kind of the goal. Yeah. I think, I think you're, you're on the track, right? Track. <laughs> I don't know. I, and I do, and what I've found is, and so I know you got it. We got to wrap up, but what I've found is, is that um, I have to have partners and, and that, mm-hmm. that takes some of that off of me. So yeah. I, in everything that I do, at least in the last, I'll say five years, uh, if not longer, I'm trying to find the partner to do it with. Mm-hmm. And that partner has to work as hard as me. Or yeah. harder, actually, preferably. Yeah. Um, so Tony and I do the podcast together, but now we've hired a producer um, so she can take some of that paperwork stuff and payment stuff off of us and sponsorship, hopefully go out and get better sponsors or bigger or whatever. We have great sponsors, so I don't mm. mean that. <laughs> and then, um, but, but you know, Top by Pro, I had a partner and he did like the IT stuff that I didn't want to do or learn or anything. I just wanted right. to concentrate on the curriculum and all that um, and even the marketing side. And so, um, you know, Mermaid, I don't have a partner on. I, I kind of want one. I'm trying to get one of my daughters to kind of come in and help with that. But we don't really make much money. It's not really a, a money maker, unfortunately. You could probably get some volunteers for that because it's so big. Yeah. I haven't figured that one out yet. <laughs> I don't, I'm not super great at delegation. And so I'm still trying to figure out how to do sort of internships and mm. volunteers and mm-hmm. even at the school um, and, and trust them. Cause I feel like I end up doing more work yeah. training them or telling them, Oh, you're not doing that right. So I do have some students. We're starting to, here's another thing. I'm, I'm starting to do, do sort of working with students on real paid work. And so I'm directing a project for actually the Middle East. It's in Jordan. Um, and they're Christian creators, but it's not a Christian property. It's, it's a, but it's a series they're doing and it's to help traumatic kids with traumatic sort of problems. Like in the mm-hmm. Middle East, they, there's yeah. a lot of kids that see somebody die. There's a lot of kids that have family members that have died. Wow. They have a lot of people that are, well, being raped and, and mm. really dark, dark stuff. And these are kids more so than here in the U S right. And so right. Um, that's a big thing to address. And so these, this company has done little animated videos um, to help with uh, trauma, uh, with kids trauma and they're entertaining and they're being well done. They're in CG, but they came to me saying, well, and through a friend um, we, we, you know, we want to have 2D animation segments in here where they, they look at a children's book and it's real sort of children's book style. And so at first I said, no, I'm like, I, I have a million things. Like, I just can't do it. And I mean, it's great, but, you know, and they didn't have much money at all. Um, and I said, it, it would take at least twice that amount. And I'd have to be able to bring in students to do most of the work, but I would direct it for like a mm. low fee and kind of oversee it. And sure enough, they came back, they doubled the money. And I asked a couple of students that were, one was graduating and a couple was, and the other one was about to. And so I put a couple of the students in charge and they got an amazing summer job. We're making a eight minute 
a uh, little animated, it's more limited animation, but they're art directing it, animating it, cleaning it up. Mm. And it's all going to be within this thing for the Middle East uh, to help kids with trauma. And so it has a really important message to it. And, and they're, they're loving, I mean, they're stressing. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to pretend that there's not that because we're, we're, it's two episodes and we're on the end of the first one and they still have another one to do, but, um, but they're doing amazing. And it's mm. like, this is the kind of job that you would work on, you know, like when I left, uh, I was fortunate. I went right into Disney, but most people, they graduate. If they're lucky, they get into a small studio and they do the ink and paint on that kind of a project. I'm like, I got my students, they're the heads of it. They're designing the look of it. They're design. they're animating the whole thing. I'm not touching wow. any of the animation. That's incredible. And so, um, and it's turned out great. Cause I mean, I can pick these students. They're, they're, quality um students and so i thought they could handle it and so far they're doing amazing we, before that we did a project for the tennessee titans me and about 20 students mm -hmm. and so unfortunately it was right right just as mermaid was starting <laughs> but uh but we got that done and so yeah it's been a busy time but um super blessed that i could work that into the program too is that we're starting to do like actual work for a higher work where the students get paid um, even while being students. Wow. So that's a one. I mean, incredible. What, what a perk to uh, Lipscomb. It is. If you're, if you're in yeah. animation, if you want to study animation and you're in the U S Lipscomb university, looks like the place to be. It's hopefully getting there. We're five. Not years Azusa. Then. Not Azusa. Forget not Azusa. Azusa. <laughs> oh, Azusa. What? AP something. No, uh, that's not the one. No. <laughs> That's off the rails. No, that's a good program too. Uh, they're just newer. They're newer. I have yeah. like three years uh, on them. So that's cool. They'll be doing it. Well, Tom, this was fantastic. I enjoyed it was. Uh, talking you, with Tom. you and seeing what was going on and uh, getting to know you more. Um, you got some great things going on and you know, you're going to get Ryan Sequest to run for his money one of these days. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't think they're going to hire me to take any of his jobs. That's for sure. Uh, I don't know. You never know. You never know yeah. what happens. Some strange things go on in this world. these I, I, days. I want to host a countdown in New York. That's what I want. <laughs> That's your bucket list. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Todd. This is a great, uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. It was Fantastic. fun getting to know you too. You'll find links to the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast, Lipscomb University, and some of Tom's books in the show notes of this podcast. Tonic DNA is an animation studio based in Montreal. We're always on the lookout for talented artists to join our team who are committed to artistic excellence. You can find Tonic on the web at tonicdna.com. This has been the Story Driven Arts Podcast. For more resources, visit our website at storydrivenarts.com. Music is by Lee Rosevere.